hate you both. I've hated you ever since I can remember. I hate you, and I wish you both had cancer. Cancer? Yes, in the head. <gasps> I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain! Are you telling me you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? This is the stupid answer no. Uh-oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> People seem to like me because I am polite and I'm rarely late. Don't worry, I got an idea. And now, the host of the Stupid Cancer Show, Matthew Zack. Woohoo! Not that there's anything wrong with him. Because he has a lot of chit spot. <laughs> All right. Hello and welcome to episode 372 of the Stupid Cancer Show, the voice of young adult cancer. I'm your host, Matthew Zachary, a proud 19-year, actually now 20-year brain cancer survivor coming to you live now from the chemo deck, our fabulous studio in downtown Manhattan. Broadcasting since 2007, the Stupid Cancer Show is a production of Stupid Cancer, the largest charity comprehensively addressing young adult cancer online at stupidcancer.org. I'm Kenny Kane, co-founder of Stupid Cancer, welcoming all of our first-time and returning listeners. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes and following us on SoundCloud. It is not okay that 72,000 young adults are diagnosed with cancer each and every year. So, got cancer under 40? Sucks, huh? Well, it's time to get busy living, folks, because the stupid cancer show is changing the world one chemo infusion at a time. Season 18, if you can believe it, the season 18 broadcast premiere featuring Johnny Physical Lives, the story of the secret world of two brothers making a rock and roll documentary as one goes through the treatment for leukemia. When his younger brother Jonathan passes away in the midst of the production, older brother and first time filmmaker Josh Newman must finish the project on his own. Joining us to discuss the documentary, Johnny Physical Lives, is uh, Joshua Newman, the director, and Pete Lee, the editor and producer. All righty. With that, welcome to the season 18 broadcast premiere of the Stupid Cancer Show. Let's get it started. I think we had this conversation when I met you in L.A. a few years ago that I went to Cutcher's and Awana. So we were Jew yeah. competitive camp summer people. We just separated by a lake. That's it. Just a lake. We, the, you, you sports people mocked us non-sports camp Jew people, and it was wonderful. I was, you know, I was like while I was a competitive sports kid, I was like the statistician at the end of the bench. So I, I probably shared more in common with you than uh, my campmates. Probably fair enough. Definitely fair enough. Um, so yeah, I, for, for our listeners, uh, uh, Joshua and I go back a, a little while now. Uh, we were involved. Uh, I was very humbly named a, a good hundred person of the year uh, two years ago. And uh, I know you've been talking to Thea Linscott, who's actually, ironically, our new board chair, which is amazing. She's a wonderful person. And, uh, you know, I've been very aware of your story and your brother's story. And you were telling me about this film years ago. And in the film, you actually say it took you 10 years to write, but here it is. Um, I was uh, hoping before we get to just to Pete introduce himself, can you just give us a really quick snapshot of your brother? Because uh, you guys were clearly incredibly close and uh, this is uh, sadly not a, a rare story for siblings to go through something like this well yeah absolutely i mean I'm part of what also just some context part of what drew me to you is that like the resource your your philosophy your resources everything that stupid cancer is all about is really what i wish my brother had had when he was going through his experience in 2000 he um he was uh, in a garage rock band called The Physicals um, at Tufts University, and uh, he was known around campus as Johnny Physical. Uh, and Johnny was sort of everything that Jonathan wasn't. He was like this sweet-talking, 
badass from the mean streets of New York while Jonathan was like, you know, kind of sweet Jewish New Jersey kid. Um, and in, in late 2000, uh, he, he, he got, he was diagnosed with leukemia. He was having like headaches, neck aches, um, for a while. And actually he was like, do you think I should go to the infirmary? And I said, yeah, I mean, it could be nothing, but who knows? Maybe it's cancer. I literally said that to him. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, no, it's true. Um, but, you know, he um, he just didn't let go of his um, individuality, his identity, his and even his alter ego. So a couple of weeks into his treatment, when his uh, blood counts were perilously low, he had a concert at Memorial Sloan Kettering in the day room for the other patients. We invited a bunch of friends. He couldn't, you know, shake anybody's hand and he couldn't talk to anybody after the show, but he wheeled himself in, in an, with an IV machine and he, perform, he introduced himself as Johnny Physical, played some songs, and I was there uh, capturing it on video in the front row. And, and after we regrouped, um, I was just like, we got to do something with this video. And he said, you know, let's make a rock and roll documentary about Johnny Physical. And so that's really where it started. Throughout his, um, you know, experience, his ordeal with cancer, he was creating music, making music. Um, in fact, he was having a creative kind of foment in a way. He was just a songwriting machine and a performing machine. And he, he never met an audience he didn't like. He loved getting performing for people in the hospital, outside the hospital. And, um, you know, obviously it didn't, the, the rock and roll documentary didn't end up the way we thought it was going to end up. Um, but, and that's part of the reason for the 10 year, for the you know decade that it took me to figure out how do I finish this without him. So Pete, uh, how did you meet Josh? I mean, this, it, and it sounds, this is such a unique project. I, I dare ask, have you have you been involved in anything similar in your career? No, I I, I have not. I mean, I um, I remember hearing about uh, Johnny way 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 back in the days when I was going to school in Boston. Uh, it was through a friend of a friend, but uh, you know. Um, Johnny's like passing really, really impacted uh, this friend of mine. So I remember that made a huge impression on me. Uh, and then it was what almost ten years later when uh, I got I got a phone call from uh, the same friend and you know told me to uh, talk to Josh. And in the beginning, it was just you know conversations that were uh, you know fairly informal. It was just kind of about uh the filmmaking process and uh, you know like spitballing best ways to you know attack a story it's all very like uh engineering oriented type uh storytelling just trying to problem solve trying to figure out how to fit all this material and and how to do like the coolest things with it and what other things have been done you know in the similar vein and just the more we talked about it, the more we got excited and the more you know, like very, very quickly, I let on. I, I I let on that I very much wanted to be a part of it, and that was what three years ago. Yeah, so, yeah, probably <laughs> around three years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, for those of you who who uh, well, actually, no one's really seen it because you sent me like a private reel, and it, it's it's really very well structured. It goes from almost like found footage, which is really cool, to you, you've, uh, dare I say, like graphic novelized it in a sense. I was thinking Aeon Flux a lot when I was watching it. Yep. And I hope that's a compliment because I love Aeon Flux and I miss Aeon Flux from back yep. in the MTV days. So uh, where did that creative idea come from? Why did you think that that was the best way to, to express Johnny's story well, as a narrative? Yeah. For me, yeah. I mean, I think I wanted to tell a story that was badass you know that was you know strange and darkly comic a little inspiring and of, of course sad as well I mean that Jonathan's story was a lot of things it wasn't just sad and that was 
you know, I didn't, that was the tightrope, I think, that all the, and that's the tightrope all these, like a lot of films that deal with cancer uh, walk. They, you know, you don't want to whitewash the whole experience and, and make it seem, and you sort of pull a life is beautiful type uh, situation. But on the other hand, you don't want it to be just like, you don't want the person's spirit to disappear and just their identity to be usurped by this disease, especially when they were fighting so hard themselves to to um, express, hold on, cling to their identity and and stay human during such a, you know, hard to, a time where it's so hard. So, you know, I think it was ultimately, I didn't, the, you know, I didn't set out to make a movie with animation. Um, it was a, a bit of a last resort. When, whatever I did when I sh- to f- contextualize the footage, when people who didn't know Jonathan's story or wasn't weren't directly affected by him saw, you know, just sweet kid, bald head, they just felt sad and nothing else, regardless of how uh, this, what was before it, regardless of what was after it, regardless about what the voiceover was saying next to it. Um, it was just too powerful and, and understandably so. And I realized I needed an entirely different <clears throat> visual language um, to do justice to the compl- complexity of emotions I was trying to evoke. Like um, I needed, and, and what better way than to express, um, you know, an alternative rock and roll experience than by depicting this kind of crazy rock and roll universe. So we brought on an animator um, from, he's from Toronto, named Style, they're called Style 5 TV, their animation studio out of Toronto. And I really wanted, I, you know, I told them a lot about Jonathan. I told them, you know, and I really, we, we scripted things out, storyboarded things, um, and tried to create this almost like Wizard of Oz um, universe that, um, bore some resemblance to it was to what Jonathan was going to, but it may it could help the audience feel the story through the eyes of a rock star. No, very well put. I mean, in, in the storyboarding too, where did you draw inspiration from? Did, I mean, I mentioned Anne Flux because that was my mm-hmm. my brain went to that. But clearly this is there's been a lot of thought and a lot of time put into this. Did you instantly have this sense that it has to be you know, this, this, uh, Sin City, you know, mm-hmm. very, cause it's very bloody and it's very graphic and, and it makes yeah. a really strong point. Was that intentional? Well, he had leukemia. So the blood was sort of, yeah, <laughs> had of course. To be bloody. but, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of style, I wanted a couple of things. I mean, I wanted it to kind of really feel like, feel like 1970s New York, which was like the kind of music my brother liked. Um, Velvet Underground, New York Dolls, Iggy Pop, even though he wasn't New York, but you know, like um, Johnny Thunders, all those influences are in there. And so I wanted it to really like feel like that world. Um, I also wanted it to you know, speak to other rock and roll documentaries. It sort of felt like it had to when Albert Mazels came on. Um, Albert, you know, you might remember Mazel's brother's names from Grey Garden, Salesman. Um, um, Give me shelter. Yeah, obviously, Give Me Shelter, um, the, the Rolling Stones concert in Altamont. Um, he was working on a project at, at the, while Jonathan was in the hospital through friends. He asked if he could shoot my brother, and he ended up interviewing my brother in this moment where I really feel like life imitated art like to this absurd degree here Jonathan and I were making this rock and roll documentary um about um about uh you know like where he was sort of feeling like he was part of even though he was in Memorial Sloan Kettering in the in the Upper East Side he felt like he was in you know at the Chelsea Hotel in the 1970s and um here the like iconic filmmaker of rock and roll in the 1970s asks if he can interview him. So Albert came to the hospital and, and so I really, yeah, I mean that he interviewed him and that footage is in the film and we see, you know, I, it's actually my favorite scene I think in the film is when 
Albert Measles is interviewing Jonathan Newman at Sloan Kettering, and then we flash to the animated universe of Johnny Physical, and Albert and his brother and his late brother David are interviewing Jonathan at the, Johnny Physical at the Chelsea Hotel. That's um, so we yeah we knew we needed you know in terms of like the style of that animated world. I think we tried a bunch of things. I remember, you know, He Man and Masters of Universe was a big. Uh, I don't know, you, Pete. Do you remember other like stylistic references? Yeah, stylistically, I think also, uh, I mean, a lot of it was just from the, you know, like the history of the animator's own work. Uh, you know, the, the head animator, his name is Sam, and he's done things that are pretty diverse. And, uh, and, and one of the things that we talked about, uh, that we geeked out on, is uh, a little... A uh, Japanese studio called Studio 4C. I think that's what it's called. And they do kind of, um, you know, uh, animation that doesn't really look like Japanese animation. It looks like American animation from the 70s. You know, it has that like hard graphic edge. So um, we, we, we talked a little bit about that. But mainly the other references or the other things that we looked at were all to support, you know, Josh's main aesthetic. You know, there's been this spate of, uh, I, I would call it the pop cultureification of cancer over the last yep. couple of years. <laughs> and I've been luckily fortunate enough to be involved in some of those scripts and screenplays and productions and uh, My Sister's Keeper and the um, uh, 50-50, the Chasing Life series and the uh, me, uh, what was it called? Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl. I, I've been privy yep. to those, to the writers and the production. In fact, uh, the um, uh, Chasing Life actually had stupid cancer products on set. So <laughs> they were actually art imitates, life imitates art, which is fascinating. So the, is, is it helping? Is it destigmatizing? Is it desensitizing? Or is it making things more difficult for us to talk about what cancer really is? Wow. That is, that's a great, you know, it's a complicated question. I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's a yes or no. I think, you know, you, you listed a bunch of, um, a bunch of, uh, pop culture, um, you know, representations, you know, fault in our stars, uh, farewell to Hollywood. Also that's this short, thank you for playing. We looked at them all. We looked at, you know, we looked at the big C and, uh, you know, to a certain extent, you know, breaking bad. I mean, I, you know, Johnny Physical. Johnny Physical was to Jonathan what uh, Heisenberg was to Walter White in right, a weird exactly. way. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, look, uh, in the most broadest, in the bar broadest terms, or take a step back. It's good that we're not whispering cancer in hushed tones anymore, right. and it's good that um, you know. A, yeah, it's good that we can share this story and, and people can experience this story um, where they exp and and it doesn't feel like um, and it feels like it can be it can still play in pop it, that red band society can be on a major network is a really big deal it sends a great message um, yeah I think it's a bit of a double edged sword um, I think. Um, you know, having the courage to speak cancer's name, if you want to put it that way, um, you know, while it's given voice to millions, it's also sometimes it constructs characters who, who are ultimately like just defined by their disease. Um, and, and they get weirdly stripped of their humanity in a way that uncomfortably, at least for me, uh, uncomfortably mirrors the way that their cancer strips them of their, you know, humanity. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was very self, I think, look, some of these are more guilty than others, um, in doing that. Um, I just, you know, I want to see characters that for whom cancer's a part of who they are, um, but not like a just a complete anchor for their entire being. 
Um, so I would say, yeah, generally moving in the right direction, but, but there are these uncomfortable hiccups, I think, along the way. Well, it's a good litmus test for Pete. I, I would ask, uh, did you come to this a cancer virgin? Thankfully, you not having it, perhaps, or no one in your family, and you were introduced to what this actually is in real life. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, when I was pretty young, I, I, I watch how um, my mother having to take care of my grandmother, you know, I, I watch how that changed my mother in a way that she, I don't think she would notice or admit to to this day. Um, and uh, incidentally, last year, you know, my mother uh, was diagnosed with uh, early stage breast cancer and it was far less scary because of you know just uh, talking to josh so much about it and you know having done this film so she's uh you know uh luckily you know it it, it, it was one quick operation and she's still recovering but um yeah I, I i came into a more or less not having really been affected uh, by it in the way, you know, in, 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 a, in a very profound way. Uh, and I, I came into it pretty ignorant to, you know, just, uh, the thoughts that you have day to day when you're, de when you're dealing with something like this. Um, and I was, um, uh, I remember like, you know, some of the first questions, uh, that I asked of Josh were kind of, questions that pertains more to like the movie uh, uh movie depiction of cancer rather than an actual experience so for example one of the first things i asked him you know just when we were brainstorming uh how to structure the story and and, and there's so many ways to do it one of the first things i asked was well what lessons did you learn from it and right away josh just corrected me you know there's no it, it this thing is so complex it's not just a lesson or a moral or an arc that you go through. Um, and, and, and I don't know, that was pretty illuminating and that was, he was pretty concise and, but I think I got it after that or I was on my way. And, uh, Josh, what were you, um, how are you in the sense of bringing someone else onto this project that you were holding so personal and dear to yourself? Yeah. Um, you know, it was, you know, um, Look, I mean, it's it was hard. Um, you know, it. The I had already. You know, it was weird. I was sort of brought onto this project by my brother. I mean, we were working. It was our project. It wasn't my project. It wasn't. You know, this was our thing. Um, we were going to be on this show together, talking about. Like, I'm sorry, this show. You, your show. I mean, we were going to be theoretically doing this together, talking about two brothers who one got cancer and they made a rock and roll documentary about it. And here they are to talk about it. I mean, so, you know, I think it was, you know, it was, it was hard to let somebody into that, you know, pre-existing collaborative space. But one of the things that I, th I think the thing that, about working with Pete that like immediately... Like Pete was able to be critical of this. He he didn't like um, he wasn't like walking on, even though he didn't wasn't directly affected by cancer and um, you know hadn't had experiences like mine. He understood how seriously I took this as a work of art. Um, that I wasn't really trying to create a like legacy for my brother I wasn't trying to I mean it happened to be I mean I wasn't against it being a nice testament to his life but I wasn't trying to like make a movie about how special he was I was trying to tell a story about a specific person at a specific time overcoming some challenges in some in a really unique way in a really creative way and um you know, he got that. And as a result, you know, our first meeting, I remember him just like, you know, being really critical of certain things I was saying, um, really appreciating um, the level of, um, you know, questioning I was doing of the narrative. 
um, how much I had thought about the story. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that was largely it, just having a real seriousness about storytelling. So I always ask this question, but it's kind of a loaded question, is what would Josh's message, John, what would John's message be uh, to other cancer patients? I mean, fighting on and all the cliche stuff, but this is sounds very different in tone. What, what would he, if you asked him point blank, what do you want other people to know about you and your story? Yeah, I think it's, you know, he wasn't, my brother wasn't a super profound guy. I mean, he was like, um, he was, you know, he was like, um, he preferred to show. <laughs> I'm a, I'm very much a teller, um, my personality, I think. Um, he would probably be the quiet one in this interview. Um, but I think it was just like, this is time to, you know, this is also time. Um, I think there wasn't a lot of... Um, I mean, there wasn't young adult cancer wasn't a thing <laughs> when he was diagnosed. He his whole his those that you know year and a half he didn't meet one young adult with cancer, um, and he was very willing to find them. He was at Gilda's Club every week at at a support group. It was mostly like middle aged women going through, you know menopause. Whatever the, whatever well. <laughs> I remember one time, funny story, he came back. I, I was in he was uh he went to the one in downtown right by the the film forum, came to my apartment afterwards and I was like, Oh, how was your group? And he goes, Well, today I learned that it can be really pleasurable if I rub my breasts. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, but you know, the, the big, I think one, one nice idea he had that kind of captured his approach to living was just, yeah, this is time to like, I, when people say, don't worry, if people would say, don't worry, you'll, you'll be better before you know it. Or, um, the time you'd spend in treatment will just fly by, you know, he didn't really want to be better before he knew it. And he didn't want his time to just fly by. You know, he wanted the time that he was fighting cancer um, to feel like it was part of, maybe it's not going to be the most fun period in his life. Certainly it's not going right. to be. But he wanted to be part of his, his, his life's journey and not some like, like you know, horrible detour. Um, he didn't want to think of it that way. So that, that I think was a nice, a nice way, a nice thing that he would probably, that, he, that his um, story um, illuminates. Well, we have about two or three minutes left. I'd love to you to share with our crowd what is the future of the film? Is it going to festivals, and where can people learn more and eventually see it? Cool. Yeah, I mean, I think it's you know it's a unique film because it's a short film, but it's long for a short film, so it's hard for film festivals to program it. it it is doing the festival circuit and it did premiere in in a really great festival in november and it will be you know will be on the film's facebook page we'll be talking all about uh keeping people abreast of where it'll be screening uh throughout the year but we're also trying to organize some independent screenings and and i, I want to get this film into hospitals too so that's that's something i feel like um you know you're 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 community might be able to help me. It's still, God, it's still got a long ways to go. Um, yeah, it's pretty lot. early in the festival season, so. Yeah, yeah, but, um, you know, you can learn more about the film at johnnyphysicallives.com. Um, the Facebook page is uh, Johnny Physical Lives, the uh, fan page, and uh, Johnny Physical on Twitter. But, yeah, I mean, I think ideas... Um, for distribution, informal screenings, and particularly like ways of getting this into hospitals as a resource, I think would be super appreciated. So if you do have any um, ideas or you want to help uh, it, after viewing the trailer, the trailer is on the homepage um, of our website. And it really, it's nice. So you'll, you'll get what we're talking about once you see the trailer. Um, and that's on johnnyphysicallives.com. Um, and if you have ideas about distribution or just want to um, say hey, 
Um, you can email us at johnnyphysicallives at gmail.com. Well, Josh Newman, Pete Lee, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing Johnny's story. Again, johnnyphysicallives.com is the website. Guys, check out this film. Uh, I hope we can do some really cool things together in the future with it. It's definitely worth paying attention to. Yeah, I'd love to right. talk to you about that offline, uh, Matt. That would be cool. All right. Take care of yourselves. Be well, Thanks, gentlemen. All right, it's bye. a pleasure. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, Kenny. Great show. Season 18. It's pretty amazing. All right. And now it is time for our closing sequence. Prepare to activate. Uh, I hear there's rumors on the uh, internets. You ever seen a grown man naked? And so, to all of you, a fond farewell. Hooray, I'm helping. You are a meathead. Oh, Magoo, you've done it again. That was so terrible, I think you gave me cancer. Okay, folks, that's our show. The 372nd episode of The Stupid Cancer Show. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes and following us on SoundCloud. I'd like to thank our guests, Kelly Davis from New Jersey, Josh Newman and Pete Lee of the epic film Johnny Physical Lives. Broadcasting since 2007, the Stupid Cancer Show is a production of Stupid Cancer, the largest charity comprehensively addressing young adult cancer online at stupidcancer.org. Coming to you from the chemo deck, and on behalf of my team here at the Stupid Cancer Show, we hope you had as much fun as we did poking a stick at Stupid Cancer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you back on the next exciting podcast of the Stupid Cancer Show. Goodbye, folks. 25 diagnosed when you're engaged Imagine having